coming to worship with this day as we celebrate the third Sunday after the Epiphany. We begin our service this morning with hymn 507, Holy, Holy, Holy. May God bless our worship today. I didn't, I have last week's bulletin. <laughs>
true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings of death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thank
Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we heard the account in our Old Testament reading of Naaman coming to the Lord, the God of Israel, to be saved from leprosy. Now there are several things in this account which we can kind of miss, and definitely miss the significance of when we read this. We see in this account not just the almighty power of God, but also the salvation which he brings both to Israel and to the entire world and to us today. We see how exactly God manifests his glory. So let's dive in and see what's going on here. Naaman is not just any foreigner. He's a Syrian. The Syrians were plagued to the Israelites, constantly attacking them and attacking them. Not only was he a Syrian, but he was a commander of the Syrian, of the Syrian army. Which means he was personally responsible for sacking, burning, pillaging Israelite cities. This pagan would come in, sack cities, and take people away. And actually we saw the result of one of this in our reading today when we heard now the Syrians of one of their raids, the Syrians on one of their raids carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. And she worked in the sermon, service of Naaman's wife. Naaman is this pagan, not just any pagan, a Syrian pagan, and not just any Syrian pagan, but a Syrian pagan who's personally responsible for killing Israelites and raiding their cities. And he has lepers. Now this could mean a very, like a lot of things actually. Leprosy is kind of a catch-all term in the Old Testament for various diseases that present themselves on the skin. But they all have kind of two things in common. One, they're usually pretty painful. And two, they almost always lead to death, a suffering death. If you have leprosy in Old Testament times, it's pretty much a death sentence. You're going to die and it's going to be painful. So he has no hope. But then he hears from this little girl whom he captured and gave to his wife as a servant. He hears from this little girl, if only my Lord were in Israel where there is this prophet. If only my Lord were it in Israel where the God of the Israelites is present. You see, the Israelites had something different when it came to leprosy. That is, they actually had hope. They had a process of going to the temple where the presence of God was and being saved by God from their leprosy being washed clean from their leprosy by God. The Israelites were the only ones in Old Testament times who actually had any hope in regards to this disease, or these diseases. And so he hears this, and he goes. Now why does Naaman go? Again, not because he has faith, but because he has no other hope. This is his only chance. His only chance at life. And you can tell what he thinks his life is worth because how much does he bring with him? Ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, ten changes of clothing. Now this is also something we can kind of just breeze over because who here knows what a talent is or a shekel? We kind of just see these numbers and we're like, oh yeah, that's fine, right? Well, a talent is 250 pounds. A shekel is like... Two-fifths of an ounce, something like that. Well, I did the calculations at any rate. By today's standards, just the gold and silver alone would be about five million dollars. That's how much he's bringing. Five million dollars. Because he realizes this, this is only hope. This is his cure for death. So Naaman brings this vast sum. Because he knows there's no other cure. But then there's a problem. You see, Naaman, bringing a king's ransom, being this great commander, comes, and he doesn't quite get what he expected. For one, Elisha doesn't even talk to him in person. Elisha sends one of his messengers out and says, 
Go tell Naaman to dip in the Jordan River seven times. Now, this wasn't the cure for death that Naaman was expecting. No, he was expecting something magnificent, something glorious. He wanted Elisha to come out, wave his hands over, the, over Naaman and his people. He wanted lightning to come down from heaven, the power of the Almighty God to reveal himself. And instead, he's told, go dip in the Jordan seven times, something very mundane, very simple. Naaman even responds, this Jordan is even that great. It's actually a small river compared to some other rivers. And it's actually kind of a dirty river. All of these cities along the Jordan, all these towns along the Jordan, that's where all their waste goes, is into the Jordan River. That's why they have to so often go to the wells instead of the river to get their drinking water, because you don't want to drink from the Jordan River. So there's all these, uh, these other rivers that he can just think of off the top of his head. These are greater. Why am I even going to the Jordan? This is nothing. This is filthy and it's small. But then, Naaman, Naaman's servants point something out that he's missing. He's so focused on the mundaneness of this act, of this river, that Naaman misses something. His servants recall to mind the words that Elisha actually spoke. They say, they say to Naaman, Has he actually spoken to you, wash and be clean? Wash and be clean. In that word is a promise and a command. And so Naaman, spurred on by the word, by this promise of being restored, grudgingly goes down to the Jordan, dips himself seven times, and according to the word of the man of God, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. And you notice there too, his leprosy didn't just flake off. His skin wasn't as good as it was before. It was actually better. His flesh was made anew, like the flesh of a little child. There's something creative going on there. God is making his flesh anew. And so Naaman, this pagan military commander, is washed and made new by God through water and the Word. Is that starting to sound a little bit familiar? Being washed and made new by God through water and the word? What is this pointing to? How does God reveal to himself today, to us, his glory and his salvation? This is all pointing to baptism. That's what's being revealed to us here. How will God act to save his people? How will God act to save the entire world? Through baptism. That's where we receive this promise, this washing. Because you see, we have the same problem that Naaman and the rest of the Old Testament, the people who live in the Old Testament have. That is, we suffer and we die. Now, we've gotten better at staving off illnesses. We've gotten better at staving off death. But it's still coming. We're still going to get that illness that we're not going to recover from. We're still going to die. And yet, God offers us the very cure for death itself. Baptism. Now, unfortunately, we also have another problem that the Old Testament people had, which is we look at this wonderful gift God gives, and it seems mundane to us. Well, that's water. How can water do such great things? But the truth of the matter is, it's not just plain water, but it is water combined with God's word and include, included in God's command. The same thing that Naaman's servants reminded Naaman of. It's not just the washing, but it's the promise of God included in this washing, which is what saves you. 
This is the command which is given by Jesus himself at the end of Matthew. Go therefore and baptize all nations in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's the promise we hear more and more about at the end of Mark. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. We hear in Romans from Paul that we have been buried with our baptism. We have been buried with Christ. Just so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. This is the wonderful gift we have in this mundane looking water. In baptism, we have what anyone would easily pay five million dollars to obtain. That is life eternal. A cure for death itself. Your baptism on account of Christ's death and resurrection, on account of the very word of God which commands and promises these things, deals with your death, gives you eternal life. So let us not scorn God's word and promise in baptism, but daily and gladly cling to our baptism. Knowing that God's word is true, knowing that our baptism provides us with the very hope and comfort of eternal life under Christ. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.